First Corinthians chapter 4, closing words in this camp meeting. And I, I want to talk to the pastors as well. I don't know, just have a lot of stirrings in my heart for pastors. Learn to be led by the Spirit of God. If there's anything that is precious to your ministry, is to understand that there's, you know, a whole lot of what people call pastoring today is human resources management, skills. In fact, they tell you that as a pastor, you must know people's skills. And I, and I think that's a narrative that has been driven for, and of course, a pastor must be a people person because you're sent to people. But to start learning people's skills and then when to be quiet, when to shout, when not to shout, that is what the Yoruba is called Agbari. That's psychology. Jesus didn't ask us to take a degree in psychology to pastor. So it's not, don't use native wisdom. Be led by the Spirit of God. You see, many times what men will say is right and it's popular might be wrong in the sight of God. And so you must learn to be led by the Spirit of God. Remember Acts 20, 20. Paul wrote, I mean, spoke to the elders at uh, Ephesus. He said, take it to yourselves. And to the flock, which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. That's what he said. He says, you are made an overseer by the Holy Ghost. He says, by the Holy Ghost. You are made an overseer by the Holy Ghost. Do you know, in Acts 6, when they were to choose deacons, deacons who were to handle natural things, they said, look for among yourselves men who are full of wisdom, that's the insight in the word of God, and who are full of the Holy Ghost. The church of Christ is not a PLC. So don't run it like that. It's not an NGO. It's a body of those who are bought by the blood, saved by grace, sanctified in Christ, justified by faith, who who have the indwelling of the Spirit, who are sons of God. So it's a supernatural relationship, a supernatural people. Are you following me this morning? So be led by the Spirit of God. Don't get into projects without praying over it. Pray about it. Pray about it. Many times people tell me, Pastor, I have this, I have that, what should I do? I say, go and pray about it. Pray about it. Take your time and pray. As you pray. You know, Paul and Barnabas were called by God. In fact, Paul, let me be specific. Paul was called in Acts 9. Uh, you know the story. But she didn't enter into that office immediately. Sometimes some of us are in a hurry. We're in a hurry. Say, I'm an apostle. I'm an apostle. I'm a prophet. Calm down. I guess you are used to the word calm down now. A friend of mine, pastors in Texas, said, initially when you used to say it, I used to get angry. But now I understand the meaning. I said, calm down. Pray a bit more. For you to be asking that question, you have not prayed. Go and pray. And Paul and Barnabas, Acts 13, 1 and 2, the Bible says that they were in the church at Antioch, certain poets and teachers. They ministered to the Lord and fasted. Part of that ministry was prayer. They were not praying for a job or praying for money. They were praying in the will of God, into the will of God. And then the Holy Ghost says, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work I've called them. So you must learn to be led by the Spirit of God. You can ask the pastors of Saints Community Church. We do not strategize. Am I right, guys? We don't do it. We don't strategize. We don't say, this is the what's working. We don't say, which, which, of, the, which of our meetings do people come for the most? Okay, we're going to work on that kind of meeting. We don't do things like that. Which particular day do people appear the most? That day is the day. That's the aha moment. We don't do things like that. 
People say, what, what ticks the most? What, what's the one that works? <laughs> we just are led by the Spirit of God. There's sometimes we plan things and then we just hold. So there seems to be no, it's good, it's, it's fine, but that's not just how we're led. It may not be nice in the eyes of others, but that's how to do the work of God. You cannot do the work of God with your own strength and your own strategies. You are led by the Spirit of God. So success does not mean the successful person is obedient to God. Success is human terminology for achievements, milestones. But there are no milestones in the work of the ministry. It's strictly obedience. That is why a man like Philip, a man like Philip who go to Samaria, and then just in the heat, in the middle of a mighty, mighty harvest, where the whole city, I mean, I have never, ever preached anywhere, except maybe a, a, a hamlet, where the whole city responded. Not many people have had a kind of resolve. And the whole city, so that the most prominent guy who was there and even who owned a satellite station, Selah, who mentioned God in his meetings. He came for the meetings. He received the gospel. Simon. What a, what a harvest. And just in the middle of it, God directs him to the wilderness, the desert, to meet one person. That's not success. You say his ministry went down. <laughs> you know, that means his ministry went down. How can you leave a whole city to go and meet? Now, you know, I met the Enoch. Maybe the Enoch is to move him to an apostolic ministry to governmental officials. Then he preaches to the Enoch, no follow-up. He goes back to villages and towns aside from Samaria. And we don't hear any story of him in Samaria again. So there are no milestones. It's obedience. Some folks are where they should be because of success. Success is milestones, achievements. You can have achievements in your career. Don't get me wrong. Don't get to university and say there's no need for achievement. It's obedience. <laughs> and then you come out with nothing. That is human things. If they give you work in your office, you don't say, I'm not a person of achievement. Well, you will achieve a lot of poverty. <laughs> That's natural. Thing. But don't mix natural things with the work of the ministry. In the work of the ministry, we obey. It's obedience, not achievement. Get that right. Obedience. So if you're a pastor or a Christian leader, and I've said this to many young people, I'm a young person, and sometimes I, I realize being young comes with being young. So I, I, I know that a man can be young and you have the exuberances. I was younger than this and we had a lot of exuberances. You know, that's why I, I kind of find it interesting when some elderly people try to talk down on the young. People that talk down on young ministers, there are two things. It's either they are intimidated or they never started ministry young. Because if you did like I did, nothing would surprise you. They didn't. Because if you say, this is young people, who told you this one is a man of God? And you ask the person, when did you start ministry? Age 50. <laughs> Kenneth Hagin started age 17. T.L. Osborne was 15. There, there were not more of men of God at 80 than 16. That's why I respect people. 
Because I was young, and I knew how people would look down on you in those days. They would just look down on you. I went for one conference years ago, or university then, and then they, they introduced everybody, say, um, there's one young brother that will exhort us. Uh, wait, I'm not done. Then I said, okay, so I don't even know his name. On the pulpit. Say, okay, young evangelist, come and tell us something. You know, if you don't, if you are not prayerful, all your confidence will evaporate. <laughs> but she had grown never to respond to praises or criticisms. So it didn't matter. When I was done preaching, as I came down, all the bishops there, they got up to salute me. Because the grace of God is working in me. I know. I don't need your intro. Many times when I go to preach and they put something on the screen. Now the next speaker. The next speaker. I don't know where they got that stuff from, but then it's fine, it's fine. The next speaker. An uncommon man. <laughs> when they say things like that, and I'm sorry for all my hosts, I'm sorry I have to say this. When, they, when I hear this, I just say, not me, not me. <laughs> An uncommon man. He has uncommon, uncommon. Just give me the microphone, let me talk. <laughs> You know, let's learn not to respond to things like that. Some people, Facebook friends, you are thinking they are your church members. Did Facebook say church members? He said friend request, not membership class. <laughs> so don't get carried away. It's friend request. And most of them are not even your friends. So get that into your heart. You must learn to respond to those things with maturity. So I, I was saying, uh, uh, um, so I, I don't look down on young people. If I see a 15, 14 year old person who has the grace of God, I recognize it. I know how it looks. And he will act 14. He will act 15. He cannot act Kenneth Higgin at 14. That would be too much for a 14-year-old boy. So an elder will guide him. When he hears something new, as a young person, he wants to show up. He's normal. He wants to show up. It's a normal thing. In those days, when we hear teachings like that, we just go and harass people. It's normal. Just as you hear, as you're hearing it, you're thinking, this is how I'm going to say my own. <laughs> you go, just go and terrorize people. Do you know? And because you didn't study it well, when they now ask you questions, that are, you say, go and study. You need to study. <laughs> we have done those things before. Say, so, you need to study a bit more. You, you, this is what I'm, I'm talking about. They're deep. They're deep. It's because you didn't hear it well. But you will grow. Hallelujah. Because the more you teach, the, get, the better you get. The more you teach, the better you get. Just keep, keep at it. That's important. And so, we want to look at something very quickly because of our time. I want us to be out of here on time. Praise the Lord. I think some of us are still going to Galilee <laughs> to meet the Lord. The women should go first. <laughs> Touch me not. If I'm not yet ascended to Abuja. Sorry for that. <laughs> First Corinthians 4.1 Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Say, I'm a steward. I'm a steward. I remember Prophet Ovada, he said this to me years ago, I think it was 98, and he said, in Yoruba, and I'll say it in English, he said, Ma jora eluju. You know, jora eluju means do not become big in your own eyes. And I understood what he was saying. Don't become big in your own eyes. You are a steward. Let me say it properly. In the work of the ministry, you are like a houseboy. You are a servant. You are a servant. That's what you are. You are a servant. So you must see that. Say, we are stewards. And I'm going to just explore that a bit this morning uh, as a steward. The word steward, there is a manager. Someone 
who is given to superintend over affairs is not the owner. The steward must never think is the owner. In Luke's Gospel 16, sorry, Luke's Gospel 12, let's look at that word steward. Luke's Gospel 12, verse 42, where Jesus gave the parable of the wise and faithful steward. Why is he a steward? Because he was given something to manage. Luke's Gospel 12, 42. And Luke's Gospel 16 as well, verse 1. A steward. And verse 3. And verse 8. So a steward is a servant, a manager. You discover that in no parables, there was someone who gave the steward something to do. Go and do this for me. So you are not doing it for yourself. You are not doing it for Shagun. You are doing it for him. So you are a steward. A servant. A manager. So he says, now in Romans 16, 23, the same word is the Greek word oikonome. Oiko, sorry, oikonomo, sorry. Romans 16, 23. He uses this for a man by the name of Erastus. The chamberlain, he calls him, of the city salutes you. Now, the word chamberlain there is a steward. In this instance, the chamberlain is a financial steward. Someone giving duty, like a treasurer of a state. If he takes part of the money for his personal life, that is corruption. No, they say he's stealing. Or both. He mustn't take part of it. He must not use the resources of the state for himself. So a steward must not use that position to enrich himself. He mustn't use that position to foster his, his, his aims in life. And that's something some, so many people have not done. As a younger man, I had very strong ambitions. But I knew and thank God for reading people like Brother Hagen, his books, Following God's Plan for Your Life, and uh, Plans, Pros, and Pursuits. I knew you had to separate those ambitions. You mustn't bring those ambitions into the work of the ministry. Because some, they, they, they wanted to become famous in life. Own things, own buildings, own estates. But they can't separate that desire from this stewardship. You cannot use this stewardship to achieve that. You need to separate it. The ministry is not a means of becoming rich. People can give you, no doubt. Nobody's taking that out of you because people support their pastors. They support them. Galatians 6, 6 says you support those who teach you. First Timothy 5, 17, 18 says you honor them, you know, who rule well. And you know, different people can give different things to people. A member of a church can give his pastor a jet. That's not wrong in that. But the pastor must not see the ministry as a means to own a jet. So if it comes, fine. If it doesn't come, he's not grumbling. Like Paul says, I have been instructed both to have and not have. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So you don't come to church and say, look at you people. Look at the pastor down the road. They just gave him an S-class 2019 model. You are here. Watch him go on Okada. Are you sure you're born again? Ross, find another thing to do, not the ministry. The ministry is not for things like that. So that you want to rival the richest man in Africa. You want to rival the richest man in your hometown. No! You are a steward. You must not use the work of the ministry for personal ambitions. That is what he says. Are you following this now? So he calls us oikonomos. A stewardship. So, now let's get to the details now. In, first, in, in, first, so in Titus 1.7, in the qualifications of a bishop, he says the bishop, that's the pastor, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. A steward of God. So that means you're a steward of men because the word bishop is an episcopal, somebody who, over, who looks, who Episcopals are the word presbytery. You look over people. So you are a steward. 
You mustn't use people for personal ambition. People can serve you out of faithfulness and loyalty and honor, but you cannot demand it. You are a steward. You are a steward. You are a steward. That's what you are. So he says here, in the first Peter chapter 4 verse 10, so you are steward of men, First Peter 4 verse 10, as every man had, I'm good, I'm good to this in morning. As every man had received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So you are also a steward of the gifts of God. You are a steward of the gifts of the Spirit. You are a steward. They must not be used for personal estate. You are a steward. You must always let that dawn on your mind that that is who you are. You're a steward. Go back to 1 Corinthians 4. Are you learning something here? So, number one, we said you're a steward of men. Say, I'm a steward of men. Say, I'm a steward of the things of the Spirit. So, you must manage the gifts of the Spirit well. You must manage men well. Then he says in 1 Corinthians 4, and verse 1. Let us, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ. I thought we had a background to this yesterday. Did we have a background to this yesterday afternoon? Can you remember it? When we were doing comparison, very fine. So thank you for reminding, for remembering. And stewards of the mysteries of God. So I'm a steward of the word. I'm a steward of the word. That means the gospel was committed to you as a steward. You cannot use it for personal things or personal ambition. You're a steward. And so you must act that way in the way you teach and preach. You have a Sunday service. You have a Wednesday service. How do you prepare for it? Years ago, years ago, when we had just sometimes five members, six members, I would pray all night and I would study. Throughout this conference, if I slept at all at night, maybe three hours. And many of our conferences. Not that what I'm going to teach, I didn't know it before, but that's pride. That's pride. I'm a steward. I go over it again. I meditate. I pray. Because I'm a steward. Throughout the conference, most of our conference, I will fast throughout. Because that's how I started. I've not grown beyond my roots. When a man grows beyond his roots, he becomes a problem. You become a problem. You are a steward. So don't just go there. And there are three, four people, and I'll teach them. Two hours, three hours. Because I'm called to be faithful. We'll see that in a moment. You are a steward of the mysteries of God. Some people today, and I tell many people this as well. They, they abandon the flock for academic pursuits, business pursuits, and travel and leave the flock alone. They don't know that what they have done has a repercussion. Because you have to be faithful. You have to be faithful. You cannot treat God's people anyhow and expect God to commit resources to your hands again. Not that God is wicked, but you have not shown the capacity to treat his people well. If you will go for a master's degree 
or you will travel, or you will get married and leave the country. Hand over the flock properly. The flock of Christ is not those being. They are people. Treat them well. Treat the world well. Treat people well. You must treat this work as a steward. Are you still there? I have never in my life abandoned the flock. Even when things were tough. Even when there was persecution. Even when it was difficult. Even when I had personal struggles and troubles. That's never the first victim. And never a victim. You must not treat the flock that way. You must be a good steward. I'm saying even if it's a house fellowship. Even if it's a cell of two people. Even if it's one person. Do it well. Some are struggling today because of that unfaithfulness in the past. Be faithful. And thank God the Father has given us his own capacity. Hallelujah. Paul says that he called me into the ministry. He counted me faithful. So God sees you as faithful. Say he sees me as faithful. So when you don't act faithful, you are deceiving yourself. You are deceiving yourself because you are faithful. James 1, 21, laying aside all fullness and superfluity, nothing else received with meekness, the engrafted word which is implanted, how we are born to save the soul. Be you doers of the word, verse 22, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. If any be a hearer only, like unto a man that looks at his natural face in the mirror, so the way God is well, and forget the manner of man he was. I know who I am in Christ. I walk in faithfulness. Don't abandon the flock. So, you, resources are committed to our hands. So, it's not success. It's faithfulness. Look at verse 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found what? Faithful. That's the word trustworthy. If you give, for example, if you ask someone to take care of your house for you, to secure your house, and then you come back, he has painted the house. You told him to secure the house. He painted the house. Very fine. He painted the gate. In fact, he, he cleaned the floor. He washed the dishes. But all your gadgets were stolen. All the money in the safe was stolen. Was he faithful? He painted the household, but that's not why you called him to do what he did. You didn't call him to do that. You called him to secure the house. You are not called to please people. You are called to be faithful to God. Did you hear me? And when you are faithful to God, you'll be faithful to the people by doing what God asks you to do over their lives. I tell you oftentimes, the most tragic thing is for a man to do efficiently what he ought not to have done at all. Who asks you to do this one? You're organizing skill acquisition seminar. Nothing wrong in that. The Bible study is as watery as Gary and water. No prayer. The men don't know how to do evangelism, but they know how to, how to mix, uh, not that one, mix um, cake. They know how to do this. Ah, I've been blessed in that church oh. ever since I joined. I now know how to do gele. In fact, right now, I'm so blessed, sir, for your ministry. When I joined the church, that was when I knew I had this talent. So I'm now in Big Brother <laughs> to show, what did you laugh? Do you know what Big Brother is? <laughs> to show the blessings of this church. It's true. They have helped you to acquire skills. But that is not why God gave his spirit and the grace. That is doing efficiently what you ought not to have done at all. Don't major on the minors. 
The apostles knew that. When he said, we will not leave the word of God and serve tables. So, we are called to faithfulness, not to success. Say, we are called to faithfulness, not to success. That is why Paul, in 1 Corinthians 3, he says, let each man, verse 10, take heed how he builds on the foundation. You must take heed how you build. Don't start a church and say, well, eh, I know it's the word we should preach, but let's just first get people in first. Let's get them in. We'll get them in. We'll bring comedians. Someone told me, he said, if you want your church to grow, he said, you will look for what do people want in that community? What do they want in that community? Well, if you see that they are poor, that means you use deliverance to bring them so that they will think that the reason why they are poor is spiritual. So when you do deliverance a lot, you bring them. Many of them will keep coming. That one is not a steward. Down his own master. You are not called to do psychoanalysis of people before you know how to minister to them. So, hear me well. You don't do that. You are a steward. We are not called to success. We are called to obedience, to faithfulness. The word faithfulness is the word pistos in the Greek. It means to be trustworthy. You don't own these things. You are giving on behalf of another person. The flock of God don't belong to you, they belong to Christ. The word doesn't belong to you, it belongs to Christ. The Holy Ghost belongs to Christ. So you are administering these things on behalf of Jesus. You must learn that. It must dawn on you every time that you are a steward. Hallelujah. In 1 Corinthians 15, I'm just going to wrap up with that. Verse 58. Because the longer that you go, and I'm going to just mention this, the longer that you stay in the work of the ministry and you are faithful, you must guard your heart against boredom. You are just bored. Seems like you're doing the same thing. You know, when you, get, when you start out in the faith or you get into the word, the work of the ministry, and you start hearing new things, you are always excited. But when there's nothing new again, and you are hearing the new things, the, they are now old, and the same truth. There's a tendency where you start to feel, can't we try something? Do not innovate with the gospel. You are not called to create something with the gospel. You are called to be faithful to it. To be faithful to the word. So you must guard against laxity. You are just lazy. That's the first thing I wanted to say actually. You are lazy. You're just lazy. You are laid back all of a sudden. Laid back. And one of the ways to cure laziness, surround yourself with people that are on fire. There are times I look at the people ahead of me and I tell myself, never. <laughs> never. Ah, this person is still this consistent and hasn't changed and is still this given to the things of God. So don't surround yourself with ex servicemen I remember when I was a soldier. You know, in those days. You know those people that say in those days all the time. In those days. Uh, what about these days? Are you dead? In those days. Man, in those days. In those days. That one is a living sepulchre. Stay with those who will say in these days. And still have prospects for the future. Be careful. Laziness, boredom, and looseness. When you are when you are around something for a long time, you may not become familiar. And then you get start getting loose. You start to joke about the word, joke about prayer. You start to take it lightly. 
It's a symptom that you're no longer faithful. I used to tell you, the way you grow is the way you grow. How do you grow? You pray every day. You study every day. Someone told me, what is the, all these young folks, they ask you, what is the secret? I don't know why you want to hear secrets. Are you a tail bearer? What is the secret? Someone say, sir, what is the secret of your consistency? In fact, there was a, 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 a friend, a guy, a friend also, a friend anyway, we had, had known him for over 23 years. So he saw me recently. He said, you know, you are just doing the same thing I've known you for 25 years. I've been 23 years. He said, what is the secret? I said, there's nothing. It's just that I kept at it. There's no secret. You just keep at it. Through the hill and high storm, you just keep at it. There's no secret. He said, nothing at all. Nothing. Prayer, fasting, study, stay around the right people. It's the same thing. There's no new thing anyway. The same way you feel tired, I feel tired. The same way you feel like, maybe I should look for an option. I also think that way. But I tell myself, do not substitute brass for gold. So it's, there's no secret. See that, way, that way you used to wake up when you were in university, and maybe secondary school, and you wake up and you go to prayer ground and go and pray and come back and go for lectures. In the evening you do the same thing, and you have workman. It is the same thing. If it has changed, oh God, you are backsliding. You don't longer listen to tapes like that. You just read the excerpts. You look at the excerpts. Can't you see you? Your life is in excerpts. <laughs> so you are faithful. Say, so I'm faithful. I'm faithful with morning devotion. Morning devotion is not old school. Don't say I'm not. It's not morning. It's not devotion or motion. No morning devotion. Pray. Study. You have not outgrown workman. Or what do you call it now? MP3. One day it will be MP10. Just put it there. So First Corinthians fifteen fifty eight. Because when you are around for long. Boredom will set in. A dear friend of mine said this to me in 1993. I will never forget this. And I, it's always on my mind. He said, never lose your enthusiasm for things of God. He said, a man that has lost his enthusiasm has lost his life. Even though he's living. He said, you must always be enthusiastic. You want to be in the church. You want to hear the word. You want to pray. Even when it is obvious that you are tired and there's a boredom, you must never lose your enthusiasm. That has guided me. And I believe it will keep guiding me. So he says, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The word steadfast means to be firm. So I say firm. That means you hold it tight. Don't handle it loosely. Be firm. Be steadfast. Firm. When you hold something, you know how you tie? You tie something, you tie, you tie. It. If you ask Pastor Funke to tie something for you, she will tie it. And you cannot untie it. That's to tie. Have you held her hand in prayer before? Or she, oh, has she held your hand in prayer before? <laughs> Let us pray. Please, I can pray, Lord. <laughs> Firm. Be steadfast. That means whatever you have, hold it like this. Like this. Immovable. It means fixed in a place. Immovable. The word immovable in the Greek means no changing. You are not changing. Always abounding. That means increasing. When I'm steadfast, when I'm immovable, there will be increase. There will be increase. First, those who say that some people are consistently inconsistent. There's some guys like that. They are consistently 
inconsistent. I am consistent. Consistency is not what you write on Facebook alone. It's what you do in your private life. Be consistent. Wake up. Pray. You used to do videos every week. Continue doing it. You used to take retreats. Don't get to the point and say, we no longer do retreats. We are now advancing. You can see you're advancing. Withdraw yourself. Go and pray. Be consistent at those things. Even when it looks like it's boring. This, you are listening to the same teaching. You are doing the same thing. You are reading the same scriptures. You are praying the same way. But you are abounding. Hallelujah. Be consistent. Be steadfast. I close on this one. Be steadfast in prayer. Prayer has no expiry date. You pray to keep praying. Did you hear me? Ephesians 6, 18 says to pray always. First and last verse of this says to pray always. If Jesus prayed before he began the ministry, he was praying when John was baptizing him. When he was going to the cross that day, when he was to be arrested, he was praying. Praying for what? So you pray to pray. You pray to pray. You must be consistent in prayer. Be steadfast in prayer. Have, have things that you cannot toy with. Be steadfast in giving. Be a person who gives. I can never regret giving. Never. Because it's my life. Be steadfast in giving. Because the ministry is giving. Be steadfast. The way you give in church, the way you give to others to support other ministries, the way you give to others, be steadfast. Also, be steadfast in giving in the sense of ministering the things of God. Be steadfast. If you notice you are no longer ministering things to people, something is wrong. Be steadfast. Be steadfast also in receiving. And I want many of you who are pastors hear this well. I'm going to say this. I'll first start with my own people. You know the way you were when you were in school? And you get to the meeting before I got there. You remember then? You know you were not pastors. You were students. You sat down. Don't let that change. Don't let that change. Because there's an error because you are now a pastor. You no longer see the necessity to be steadfast in receiving. I told you last night. I said I was listening to who before I came. Who was I listening to? I said I didn't even know what he was preaching. I'd heard him. I was just listening to his voice. That voice has guided me for many years. It can never fail me. Omwagba. Omwijile. Omwagbara. <laughs> I'm sorry I can't say it in English. There are some things you don't stop at all. Why? You listen. You must be receiving. There are conferences I go for every year. I just sit there. You know T.L. Osborne who are taking and taking meetings as a delegate. Pastor Jordan said this years ago. He said he was at the Kenneth meeting. He said he was just saying glory, but was preaching. He just turned to his right and saw Kenneth Copeland in the crowd, taking notes. He said, see my life. See Copeland. But some men of God who wanted to introduce them. I came for the meeting. They have not recognized me. I'm not coming for the next session. Don't come. <laughs> Don't come. They recognize you as who? Are you the Holy Ghost? <laughs> Sit down there. Be steadfast at receiving. If you have been coming for a camp meeting or a program every year, don't get two, three years. You start doing your own program at that time. That's pride. That's pride. Somebody that works for you will keep working for you. Be smart. You can do that program you want to do another time. 
make this period the period you receive. Like we do the World Changers Conference, I tell people it's just once a year. And it has impacted many people's churches, not since community. Be smart. Be steadfast in receiving. Because you cannot give what you don't have. And finally, okay, two more actually. Be steadfast in the leading of the Spirit. There's not coming a time where you will not need to hear God and hear God. There's some things He told you three years ago that He wants to tell you something else this year. Be steadfast at listening, being led by the Spirit. And I'll close by saying, Be steadfast in being steadfast. Hallelujah. Be steadfast in being steadfast. Hallelujah. God has a, a lot in our future. He has a lot. He, he, I, I, I believe the, 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 the future of Africa is bright. I believe that the gospel is taking new grounds and territories in Africa. I believe it. I'm so strong about it. I, 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 I thank God for other nations that we reach. You know, all over the world, and we're grateful to God. But my heart is for Africa. Hallelujah. And by the way, I want to thank you guys for wearing green today. You know, green, I'm a, I'm a committed Nigerian. And my house in my secondary school was filled out, green. You know, and it's one of my favorite colors. I appreciate them for me. I'm not saying you wear it every service, so I just said that's it. Hallelujah. I believe the future of Africa is very bright. I believe the word of God is growing in Africa. I believe light is all over Africa. I believe a, a whole lot of things are taking place in Africa. We get reports every day from different nations in Africa about how our ministry has touched them. And I believe other ministries are doing the same thing. You know, I have so much hopes. So much hopes. And we'll never get tired. We'll keep teaching. We'll keep spreading the word. We'll keep inspiring men. All of us here will keep being obedient. None will be lost. None. Everyone is faithful. None is lost. None is loose. None is tired of this. None is weak of it. There's no one who seemingly becomes bored. We are consistent. Hallelujah. I said, I give you that song, so will I. Let's just sing that. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's just worship the Father and dedicate this time in our hearts. Just pray for our ministries. Pray for your ministry. Pray for your church. Pray for your pastor. We are steadfast at being steadfast. of creation there at the start before the beginning of time with no point of reference you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life you speak 